So let's uh, let's get started with a little bit of moving the body. So let's all stand up, please. Make sure that you have enough room to spread your arms. So close your eyes first. Stand with your feet distance apart. A lot of what we did the last two weeks and more of what we'll do the next two weeks is connecting the body with the brain and both of them with the breath. So take a few moments to feel your body with your brain and then feel your breath move through the body and then it does the brain. Then opening your eyes, bring your hands in front. Let's take a double breath in. <laughs> Tensing the body, vibrate, relax and feel. Two more times. And then pause, feel the body a little bit. Now let's awaken the brain cells, tapping your brain with your knuckles. Don't tap your brain so hard that you get knocked down senseless. But tap hard enough so that it's awakened, so you'll feel something, at least a vibration, a little bit. You're awakening the higher centers of the brain now. Then make strong fingers without bending your fingers at the knuckles, is what I mean by strong fingers. And then move the skin of the brain, the scalp, over the tissue underneath. Three times one way, three times the other. Then keep, to use technical terms, we move from the parietal lobes to the occipital lobe in the back and the temporal lobes in the top. This is just reinforcing a little bit of brain anatomy. Then, then the frontal lobes right here. A few more times, okay. Now make three fingers. We are going to awaken the medulla oblongata, the, the notch where the spinal cord meets the brain. Circle that three times one way, three times the other. Now take a double breath in. Without overdoing it, relax the chin to chest. Now tense up. Now come back. Do that two more times. Three times one way, three times the other. Double breath. Tensing back. Relaxing down. One more time. Then pause. Now we come to what's really kind of the centerpiece of yoga, so to speak. Both for the upcoming two classes and the previous two classes. There we recharge the 20 parts of the body. You will see today why this is surprisingly good for you. Okay. First, the important thing here is to connect what you want to do with what's actually happening, receive feedback, and modify appropriately. So, and what you want to do is very simple. We are not dancing or anything like that. We are simply tensing the left foot. If you wish, close your eyes if it helps you concentrate and tense the left foot. Ask yourself, am I tensing the left foot? Tense more. Am I tensing as much as I can? Is my bum coming along for the ride? If, if so, let it go, let it step off. It'll get its turn and relax and feel. Feel what it just did. That's, this is the key, this is yoga. Right foot, tense, vibrate, relax and feel. Left calf, right, relax. We'll do this a bit quicker now. Left thigh, relax right thigh, left buttock, only tense the buttock now, relax, right buttock, below the belly button, the abdomen, relax, stomach above the belly button, tense, and relax, and feel, left forearm, tense, right, left upper arm, tense, vibrate, Relax and feel right upper arm, left side of chest, right side, left side of throat, right side, center of the throat, back of the neck. Relax. Now we'll do the same thing. This requires great concentration and great energy. The more you put into it, the more you'll get back. 
We'll tense the same things, but hold the tension. Let's begin. Left foot, right, left calf, right, left thigh, right, left buttock, right abdomen, stomach, left forearm, right, left upper arm, right, left side of chest, right, left throat, right center of the throat, back of the neck. Hold, breathing in and out. Tense even more. Continue to breathe in and out deeply. And then, double exhale, relax, chin to chest. Relax, right chest, left, right upper arm, left, right forearm, left stomach, abdomen, right buttock, left, right thigh, left, right calf, left, right foot, left, double breath, intense. <sighs> Relax and feel. Once again, feel your whole body, this act of being omniscient in your body. Surprising benefits as we saw in the first class. Bring your hands in front of the heart. Make a small, make a gentle fist. Now follow the movement of the hands with your mind. Double breath in. No tension. Move the arms out. Full relaxation. Relax at the end. Enjoy the stillness. Double breath in. Move the arms back into the chest. Let's do that. Three or four more times. Take your time. The objective here is as much to sense what is going on as it is to actually do it. In fact, sensing it is far more important. Relax your arms to the side. Keep your eyes closed. A couple of breaths. And slowly, let's move back. Take your seats. We'll sit at the edge of your seat. And so we close our eyes for a little bit of pranayama, breathing exercise. So remember what we just did. This little routine has improved our circulation, lymphatic drainage, and perhaps even immunity. We'll talk about all of those today. What we're going to do next has effects on our blood pressure, good effects. Again, and I'll tell you why. Slowly, let's take an inhaling breath. Remember the diaphragmatic breath, inhale deeply. Use the diaphragm. Exhale. Feel the belly go back in with the action of the diaphragm. Once again, inhale. Exhale. If you know the ujjayi breath, make the ujjayi sound. Remember all the benefits of breathing through the nose. Inhale again. This time we'll hold the breath. Gently and bring the chin either to the throat or to the chest. Lightly energize the sides of the neck and hold your breath. Remember to keep your gaze uplifted. Exhale when ready. Release your neck first and then exhale. This is what we just did when done over many years of time, has a positive effect on your blood pressure. Once again, breathe in. Hold your breath and make the chin lock. Locking the chin either into the throat or to the chest if you can. Intuiting the purpose of this, which is to calm the heart down through blood pressure, through reducing the blood pressure. Just intuit its purpose. Lift your heart towards the chin. And exhale when ready. One last time. Do that at your own pace. I will not guide the timing for this. Intuiting its purpose, its mechanism. How might it affect the blood pressure? Lifting your heart as if to meet the chin. Exhaling when ready. Then, when you finish, sitting up straight. 
gaze uplifted. When you lift your eyeballs up and very slightly towards each other, so you're gazing at the center point, it causes our medulla oblongata to slow the heart rate down. Oculocardiac reflex. Try to feel that. Now go beyond all science and all logic. Just enjoy the stillness for a few breaths. When you feel ready, slowly open your eyes. Welcome back, everybody, and for some of you, welcome. It's uh, good to see you all again. So, uh, I guess I should identify this for the camera. This is class number three of the Science of Yoga series, and this class is the physiology of asana, yoga postures. Okay. Um, so we talked, um, let me recap briefly what we did the last two classes. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we tried to convince ourselves that meditation is very good for the brain. Okay? And um, what we found, what uh, science has found pretty concretely, as much as it does so with experience and intuition, this is, I'm talking about MRIs and uh, EEGs, it found that the brain wave slows down, indicating a state of relaxation, which typically for non-meditators can only be had with their eyes closed. This is kind of when you think of yourself as really, you know, it's kind of after a couple of drinks and a little bit of Prozac, I'm relaxing, that stuff. And meditators seem to be able to do it with their eyes open. It's kind of interesting. It's the technical name for it is alpha wave activity. It's increased. And we also found that they, they're able to do this while being aware of what's going on. So they're not out there in la la land. The technical term for that is called alpha blocking. And we found that it puts them in a state that's in a mental state that is very, very characteristic of creative activity, deep creativity. It's called the theta waves. This is when, uh, if you're not meditating, you kind of sit and really let your mind wander so that inspiration can come, except meditators do it, of course, of their own volition, but also when they are being aware. Uh, so we found that. And then... We also found very interestingly, uh, this is more sounds like psychology, except it's neurology, believe it or not, uh, that long-term meditators reduce the reactive process. The, there is a center in our brain, they are called the narrative centers, uh, narration, the one which tells the story. Um, I see a cup of coffee and you see a cup of coffee. And then, based on my past history, perhaps I have once spilled the coffee while driving, causing a painful situation. So, when I see the coffee, my narration says that I should be mildly traumatized. Whereas your narration might only recall happy beginnings of mornings with coffee. So, meditation actually reduces the activities of these narrative centers. With the net result, which Swami says so well in his book, it's nothing in all of eternity, except right here, right now. It enables us to live in the present. It also actually not only increases the cortical activity, but produces more gray matter in the areas of the brain that are responsible for emotional regulation, for reactive process, for concentration. All of these areas are increased, actually more gray matter and the ability to activate them. Uh, deep meditators, like I have been saying, with over 20,000 hours on the cushion. Those kind of meditators are able to do this. And then we saw that it reduces age-related thinning of gray matter and provides a very viable alternative to prescription drugs and other modalities when treating dementia and other such diseases. That was two weeks ago. Last week, we focused on this one particular thing, that when you want to meditate like this, when you want to rack up those hours on the cushion, so to speak, it's very, very hard to do. And therefore, there are many techniques. What we recognize as yoga, not we, I mean, we are all, of course, a little bit advanced on this 
one. But what most people, what uh, pop culture recognizes as yoga is this one. These techniques which lead us to meditation. And the fundamental intuition there is when the heart calms down and the mind calms down, then you are able to sit and go into all of these states that I just talked about. That is the science of breath. And what Yogananda said there, pranayama, the science of breath, is so advanced, people just don't realize this. And we got a taste of what it means. Uh, so these breathing techniques, uh, just breathing through the nose, uh, purifies the air, humidifies the air, and warms the air. We'll see why this is also important in immune response. Uh, in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll see that one. Uh, and we saw that the diaphragmatic breath of course, efficiently oxygenates and decarbonizes your body, which is very good. Um, and then it stimulates the abdominal organs. So just breathing deeply helps you digest better or uh, controls that irritable bowel syndrome or acid reflux and things like that. I mean, they're not immediate. It's not like taking, uh, what's that thing with effervescence? It kind of shows you Alka-Seltzer. It's not like taking one of those, but it's kind of a, uh, what do they call it? Sustained release Alka-Seltzer, if you will. It just happens over a couple of years, and then over time you'll start feeling better, uh, just by breathing. Um, and then there is a very interesting phenomenon called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is a fancy way of saying when you inhale, your heart rate speeds up, and when you exhale, your heart rate slows down. And this has two implications. One is the obvious one, that initially when you want your heart to slow down, you exhale for longer and longer. So over, over time, over 15 or 20 such breaths, since you've exhaled for much longer than you've inhaled, your heart rate has slow, slowed down. Now you're ready to return it to the more harmonious rhythm, which is desirable for meditation. Okay, everybody with me? The second part of this is it's been found, very surprisingly, that the more your heart rate speeds up on inhalation and the more it slows down, meaning that difference between speed up and slow down, is indicative of good health. So they have found that when, for people when this RSA difference isn't all that much, they were prone to more cardiac events. It's a very fancy way of saying heart attack or stroke, you know, cardiac events. Or depression, or both. And other things are now being related to RSA as well. So diaphragmatic breath, begins to help you at that level. So if you go back to what Yogananda said, pranayama is so advanced, people don't realize this. Now that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Kapalabhati pranayama, those of you that uh, perhaps came only today and uh, forgot what this is maybe, um, is where you exhale. That simple act has a very profound effect. What it does is, by decreasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the body, uh, it increases the blood pH. And then the brain says, uh oh, blood pH is more. Time to stop the breath, literally. Not in the sense time to make this guy die, but in the sense time to allow the carbon dioxide to build up. You can come in to that place of stillness and say, now I know what this feels like. So you have now the mental ability to transcend it. When you recall later, you, you know, that's how you train the brain. Um, it also calms the breaths down for the exact same reason. It's called vagal tone, this vagus nerve that I mentioned last time. So it allows the vagus nerve to become more active, meaning fire more rapidly. And when the vagus nerve fires more rapidly, the heart rate slows down the breath slows down simply by doing this. Pranayama is so advanced. Again, we just keep returning to that. Uh, and then just the act of uplifting the gaze, you engage those muscles, which the muscles that move the eyeballs are called the oculomotor muscles. And when you engage them to lift them and point them towards each other, not being cross-eyed, but very gently, those two together literally slow the heart rate down. These eye surgeons know this, anesthesiologists know this, at least the good ones do. Uh, and that's it's one of, it's part of their protocol that when these eye muscles are being pulled or otherwise uh, tractioned, they know to watch for slow and slowing down heart rate. 
Okay, and they say, that the statistics say that one out of 2,200 people who undergo eye surgery, specific kind of eye surgery, not your cataract or simple ones like that, in one out, one out of 2,200 people, their heart actually stops and they need to revive it. Of course, don't expect the heart to stop when you lift. It takes a lot more than lifting uh, and doing what we do in this, uh, in this gaze, but it also begins to stop the heart rate down. Um, we talked about the chin lock. I'll talk a lot more, but basically understand that this particular action regulates the heart rate and blood pressure in, in very, very interesting ways. We'll talk more about that today. Okay? That is so far what we covered the last two classes. Any questions? Comments? Thoughts? Random observation. Second random observation from Masha. <laughs> affects the kidneys, but the first rip thing was, and then you said, but it also affects the kidneys and the kidneys. I'll have to go back and watch the video again. But I can't that, that was a pose that we did, where we bent backwards uh -huh. very deeply, and that literally compresses the kidneys and affects it. And in fact, that's a big part of what we'll be covering today. I, I just said that because we were doing it. So keep that thought in mind. We'll come back to it. So uh, before that, Masha had a comment. Let me get... My random comment. Uh, you spoke a lot about the benefits of breathing through the nose. How about uh, you know, people like myself who have trouble breathing through the nose, and very often I just can't. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to counteract that and to increase your health and your ability to breathe well when you can't breathe through the nose? Uh, well, I wouldn't say any way to counteract that, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll offer two or three separate things. Uh, uh, for that. First of all, breathing through the mouth has its advantages. Uh, there are times when we, when we yes, uh, because there are so many topics I didn't have time to go through it. What happens is, when do we breathe through the mouth? Think about this. Yes, during energization, uh, but that's a technique. When in the course of normal events, when you're sick, uh, any other, let's, let's follow that train of thought, any other times that when you need to take more air in, that's why you breathe through the mouth. When you're sick, is you're breathing very, very rapidly, and you want to make that count. You don't have time to kind of do the full diaphragmatic thing. The, the, the mouth literally is a bigger orifice than the nose. The, the nose is much smaller orifice. It does have some mucous membranes, but it lacks the cilia. So you do get some of the benefits of it um, over time. So that's issue number one. Uh, that's thought number one. The thought number two I want to offer to you is almost anything that happens to the body, the body adapts to, to change itself so that it's no longer an issue. So with, I mean, there are no studies on this one, none at all. So none of what I'm saying has a paper that I know of which backs it. But there are enough number of things this, that papers do exist where the, the, the body literally adapts, and uh, perhaps the top portion of the lungs or the um, windpipe have adapted to eliminate more toxins as they come in. So all that is to say that it's, it's nothing to worry about, uh, or it, it's nothing to try and kind of change. Because if, if anatomically, like deviated septum, for example, is, is a very common, is, is not very common, but it's common enough that you cannot breathe very efficiently through the nose. So breathing deeply and efficiently is far more important than any other consideration with the breath. Does that kind of answer your question? No, it is, uh, I, I should have mentioned this, and this will, let me, I might as well say this now before I come to your question. Uh, especially as we begin to talk about techniques. See, when you're meditating, it's between you and the creator. You know, what happens there, you, it, that's, that's entirely a karmic activity. But once you come to the techniques, they are there only to facilitate the final end. So if, if a technique is not appropriate for you, no matter what the technique is, then it's perfectly okay, because the overall 
neural plasticity, the ability for the brain to adapt is so extraordinarily high that it, it really doesn't matter. Choose another technique which will work for you. And we'll see examples of that today as we go along. Okay? Okay. I was just going to ask, for people who already have some kind of heart condition, would they have any concerns about trying any of these things out? Excellent question. So let me, uh, that question is very important, so let me repeat it for the camera. The question was, for people with cardiovascular conditions, are there any um, warnings or things, uh, do's and don'ts, with respect to these particular breathing techniques? Yes, there are. Uh, and they are fairly straightforward. The, the overall principle of working with a cardiovascular condition, be it tension or a recent heart attack or a stroke, a bypass, angioplasty, any of that stuff. The key to working with any of those is to ensure that the heart doesn't get loaded. That's what your doctor will tell you, you know, don't lift heavy weights, don't, you know, do anything that will exert you, that kind of stuff. The same principle applies here. Having said that, what are the things within these breathing techniques that will tend to accelerate the heart in the short term before calming it down. Number one in that is holding your breath. So if you have had any kind of heart conditions, and this, this is a general statement, uh, and it has to be modified specifically depending on the what, what that condition is uh, and so forth, but in general, you should not hold your breath. Okay? So that is number one. Second one, doing Kapalabhati really, really depends on what the condition is. Um, and in general, it's not wise to do it. Uh, because initially, that rapid exhale and inhale is going to accelerate the heart. Uh, so you should, you should talk to one of us, and then we'll be able to tell you, or anybody uh, that needs to know this, we'll be able to tell you specifics of Kapalabhati and whether it should or shouldn't be done. Okay, in terms of diaphragmatic breath, it's really no contraindication at all. It's deep breathing is good. Uh, okay, but it should be calm deep breathing. It's not like you're in a competition kind of deep breathing. It's something that really slows the heart rate down. So in terms of the techniques we talked, those are the main ones. Great question. Anything else? Okay, so moving on to Today's topic, so great, meditation's good, breathing exercises are wonderful, but first we need to learn to breathe. This is not as simple as it sounds. Uh, I'd venture to say that most of us, if we are asked uh, to breathe diaphragmatically deeply for one hour, that might actually tire us out quite a bit. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not at all easy to do that. That natural diaphragmatic breath, the happy baby asleep kind of breath, is very hard to achieve for several reasons. One is that the body is filled with all kinds of toxins which impede the flow of breath. And I'll tell you very precisely what this means in a moment, but for now just keep this in mind. Uh, and then the second, the, the, the musculature, the the, the body needs to be aligned in a specific way for the diaphragmatic breath to work. And if it isn't, then it's hard. And most of the techniques, most of the physical techniques, so this is officially called Hatha Yoga, the, you know, standing on your head, touching your toes and twisting, doing all of that stuff is called Hatha Yoga. And just to keep things simple, I will henceforth refer to it as simply Yoga. Every now and then I might say asana, which is the Sanskrit name for a yoga posture, but in general I'll call it as yoga, unless I need to make a point about one of these other things, in which case I'll say it differently. Okay? So these uh, yoga postures, their main, the, the main reason why they exist is to help you breathe better and to clear your body of toxins. Those are the two main reasons. And therefore, Yoga postures do a lot with circulation. See, circulation is the main way 
that the body gets cleared of toxins. The second one it does is help improve your posture and do a whole bunch of things around that. Today we'll primarily focus on circulation. A very fascinating topic, all kinds of stuff, and we'll do a few things. And none of the big yoga poses, just pretty much the same as what we've been doing, but you'll see that in a different light. Uh, okay, so uh, the second, and this is kind of a larger purpose of yoga, is to increase the inner energy. What, what does that mean? We've all had this experience. I certainly had this experience yesterday. I was, I was preparing for this class, and for whatever reason, I was tired. I had, there's no outside reason for me to be tired. I just was. Uh, and I had two choices. Of course, I could take a nap or I could do some yoga. And remembering all of you guys and what I'd be saying to you, I thought it would be wrong for me to come here and claim that I took a nap. There's actually nothing wrong, but it just felt odd. So I thought, let me do some yoga. Uh, and uh, I did some, and all it was, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And, and, and the difference was extraordinary. We've all had experiences like this, right? This is not unique to me. Perhaps you've chosen to take a walk instead of taking a nap. Perhaps you've chosen to sit outside. Perhaps you've chosen to watch flowers and trees or go for a jog or anything. In other words, doing something active paradoxically increases your energy rather than decrease it. It's very rare to actually run the body down to when you say, I am so tired, I went home and crashed. That's often not necessary. It takes an incredible amount of effort to actually get to a place. I, there, there is a friend of mine. Uh, I wonder if she'll ever watch this video and know that I'm talking about her. Uh, <laughs> there, is, um, there is a friend of mine who, uh, who feels so sleepy every now and then that she says, uh, she goes home, parks the car, and runs to her bed to sleep. Okay, because she literally feels that sleepy. And that always makes me want to chuckle a little bit um, because partly the, the visual is just funny. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, that kind of tiredness doesn't happen often. It's almost always the antidote to tiredness is to do something. And that's the principle of yoga. What we did, 20-part body recharging, is when you, when you use your mind to bring more energy into the body, it removes fatigue by releasing the toxins which cause the fatigue in the first place. Okay, the, 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 if, if your car is not moving fast, it's, uh, it's perhaps not the case that it's not powerful enough, but it's perhaps the case that your parking brakes are on. So you remove the parking brake and it moves faster. That's roughly uh, what the principle of yoga is. And Yogananda said this, uh, the whole purpose of true exercise is to awaken that inner source of energy which we have ignored all of our lives. Okay, uh, so that is so. Those are kind of the three things. One is to increase circulation, which is the primary way of getting rid of toxins in the body, and second is to work with the body structure so that we can breathe better, among other things. And the third is to actually awaken the inner source of energy. Um, so those are the three things, and we'll we'll talk about these three in various levels of detail today, but mostly we'll talk about circulation. Before we jump into the science of circulation, circulation. first let's all stand up, please. You see, when the, when the muscles are tight, they, 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 they press, they literally press against your arteries. Uh, and when they do, so if the muscles here are tight, for example, they press against these arteries, and you will begin to feel some symptoms in your arms. And I'll tell you about all of those later, but first let's open them. Bring your hands in front of your heart. Most of you know this. This is circle of joy. We'll just do this and examine the science behind it. The first thing to do is use your arms. When you use the arms, these muscles begin to release. So press your hands together. Really press it. Everybody lift your shoulders. Not for too much then. Inhale deeply. As you begin to press, exhale, release the shoulders down. Really deeply release it down, open through the chest now. Intertwine your fingers, breathe in, breathe out. Now here, 
lift and release the shoulders down. Then think about this part, this part, and press that out. Okay, it's, it's a little bit hard to do. You might begin to feel some stretching right here. So try that. And then breathing in, lifting up. If you end up with a posture that looks similar to this, that is perfectly fine. Just press into your feet and think about growing taller. Breathe in and out. Then breathe in. Exhale. Now you are opening this part. See, you want to release muscular tension, so this is not a competition. Then the muscles will tense up even more. First, lengthen your elbows. Make them fully straight. This may be enough. If you've had a long day, this may be enough. This is producing all the stretch that you will want. Where should you feel this stretch? Along the collarbone. Feel it right along the collarbone, all through. There is a subclavian vein, which is important to the immune system. I'll talk about that. This is actually uh, making that better. Now, if you have more room, lift your arms. See, uh, first, this is the straightening, and then this is the lifting. Okay? That little by little, two more breaths. Then, slowly bring it forward. Back, let's do that one more time with your eyes closed. If you can, breathing in, press your palms together. Breathe out. Breathing in, lift your arms high up. Release the shoulder blades down. Breathe out, arms to the side. And clasping your fingers, straighten the elbows. Breathing in, lift your arms up. You can do whatever feels regular, natural with the neck. And bring it forward, in, and slowly release. Now this next one, do hold on to your chair as you do this. Or even uh, let your bum kind of touch the chair. Lift your left foot up like this. And if you feel secure enough just by leaning into the chair a little bit, then hug that foot into the, what are you hugging it into? The torso like this. Then everybody bend your knees slightly and then lift up. Oh, just feel that stretch. And then point your left toes down. Inhale and release. Now, for change, uh, changing sides, you might want to move to the other side of the chair. Some people had the right idea. You can hold the front of the chair like this a little bit too, if that works. So you can come to this position here or you can come to this position here or like this. Okay? Just a couple more breaths. Pretty much whatever needs to be stretched. For different people, it feels in different places. Most often, it's here. Okay? Then slowly release. Okay, and then shake your legs like this. And slowly sit down, please. What we'll do in the next 15 minutes is to figure out what this exactly did to us, okay? Um, in terms of the heart and the arteries and the veins and so on. First of all, the cells need oxygen, right? And they also need other vital nutrients. So they need protein, for example. They need glucose. They need vitamins, okay? And this is, you know, here you're a cell right here at the right toe trying to make a living. You know, you're doing your thing. Whatever the brain asks you to do is not a good job, but it, you know, brings home the bacon, whatever. But in order for you to do your job, you need some stuff. The, the delivery truck needs to come in, give you stuff. Then the garbage truck needs to come in and take away all the crap that you generated. Without that, you cannot do your job. It doesn't matter how good you are. Right? This cell could be glowing with health, but if it doesn't get the nutrients it needs, there's nothing it can do. So it's which, uh, what delivers the nutrients to the cell? Uh, I just remembered something that somebody told me, that it's better to stand up as much as possible while doing these classes so that I can be more visible. So I'll try and remember that. Mm. I'll try and remember that, but thank you. Um, 
So, um, it's the blood that brings these nutrients to the cell. It follows, uh, we have trillions of cells, literally trillions of cells. Does it mean that every single cell has a blood vessel next to it? What do you guys think? Is the answer up here? No, no it isn't. Yes or no? Uh, kind of. Not really within one cell, because blood vessels are cells too. What do you think? You know, say, I don't know how many we have, we probably have around 10 trillion cells or something. Does every one of them have a blood vessel next to it? The staggering answer is yes, they do. Every one of them. They have, it, it's called capillary beds. These, um, these, these big blood vessels become smaller. They, let me talk about arteries. Those are the ones that carry the oxygenated blood. They become smaller arterioles, and then they become even smaller sometimes, or just spread out. Spread out like this. Uh, you, can, you can see that right here. You see that? They, they just spread out, and then they kind of basically, this, this picture is not very accurate. Without intending to, I asked a trick question. If you looked at the picture, you would say no. Uh, but it, pretty much every single cell has its own, uh, these little capillaries, they are called. And what they do is they bring in the oxygen, and then the cells absorb it. That's fairly straightforward physics. It's the, the physics is not too different from if you have salt water and you have pure water and you put the salt water into the pure water, then the entire combined water becomes salty. This is very similar. It's called osmosis. It's not exactly the same, but it's roughly similar. Um, and then it, all of this happens within milliseconds, you know, like that. It's just continues to happen. And then at the same time, the carbon dioxide gets leached out of the cell, and then it follows a different pathway into these other capillaries, and then they, they go back uh, into the lungs. The lungs have the job of taking in the oxygen, enriching this bad blood. I say bad not because it's done something wrong. It's just no longer that useful to the body. Uh, bad blood. By leaching out its carbon dioxide, putting oxygen in, and exhaling the carbon dioxide. That's what the lungs do. Co not so much coordinating it, but at the center of this is the heart. It's uh, about the size of a human fist. It's an extraordinary um, organ. I just wanted to tell you a few things. Its job, of course, is to pump the blood. Um, and um, see, it, it weighs about 11 ounces. Okay. Um, and it pumps about a thousand gallons of blood every single day. So imagine a thousand gallons. Say, I don't know how much, how many gallons does a typical bathtub have? Any ideas? 50 maybe? Yeah, so let's say 20 bathtubs worth of blood every single day, this 11 ounce organ. They, can you imagine the strength of that pump? Here's what's interesting. The definition of death is, or the, 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 the cause of death, is when the heart stops pumping. Meaning it doesn't matter what you do, whether you're in a coma, you are asleep, you're meditating. Well, meditation's a little bit odd, let's keep that aside. Uh, <laughs> if you're doing all kinds of things, the heart keeps pumping. All the time, all the time. And do you know how far the blood needs to go with the pump? If, if, if you laid out the entire circulatory system that we have, it is, I, I actually find this hard to believe, but I verified this again and again. It would be 60,000 miles long. Okay, that's how much this, I mean, not every pump traverses through all of this, and it's, you know, at least half of it, because the rest of it is the veins, but that's still, one mile of 20 bat stops is a lot, uh, right? So, even if it's 30,000 miles, even if it's 1,000 miles, that's already unfathomable. 11 ounces, right here, all the time. And how much do we abuse it? Let me count the ways. In fact, I'll use the rest of the class to count the ways, uh, how much we abuse it. I 
keeps pumping. It's extraordinary. Uh, it's, it's just, see, the first class we focused on the brain and saw how amazing it was. The next time we focused on the lungs and we saw all the wonderful things that's happened in there. And we come to the heart and, oh, the, just the complex is not good, but complex is beautiful. Uh, you know, it's, you, you, you look at the wonderful ways in which a rose appears to you. You can stare at it for, uh, you know, many minutes and kind of still marvel at its intricacy. Uh, the intricacy of the heart is just extraordinary. The amount of chemicals, the electrical stuff, the pure, raw, muscular strength that it has. You, you can say, oh, she has a great heart in order to indicate somebody with great inner strength. It literally applies to the muscle. There is no muscle that I can think of in all of creation that is anywhere near as powerful as the heart. Just like there is no tissue that you can think of in all of creation that's anywhere near as complex as the brain. And a lot of what yoga does is handle the communication between this amazing organ and this amazing organ. So that's kind of the, uh, so heart lies at the center. Now, uh, let me just spend a couple of minutes talking about how it actually works. Heart is, of course, a single organ, but it's very useful to think of it as two organs. Think of it as a left heart and a right heart. And let me talk about the left heart. The left heart the, the pumps the blood to everywhere in the system. So when it squirts, when it contracts and squirts the blood, it goes all the way to your little toe and all the way to your prefrontal cortex and everywhere in between. And then it does that. Um, and then the right heart pumps the blood to the lungs. That's its job. And therefore, deoxygenated blood comes into the right heart and oxygenated blood comes into the left heart. Okay, everybody with me so far? So good. This thing that does the pumping is called the ventricle. Okay? Ventricle. And that's when you see a picture of the heart, that big thing that you see, that's the ventricle. Blood doesn't come straight into the ventricle. There is a waiting room where it goes, hangs around for about one tenth of a second before it comes into the ventricle. And there are all kinds of extraordinary reasons why that is so, and I'm not going to tell you any of those because it's not really relevant. But your handout has references to all kinds of other stuff. So it hangs around there. That's called the atrium. So the left atrium receives deoxygenated blood from all over the body. Okay, and there are all kinds of fancy names around this. There's the inferior vena cava, which brings the blood from the systemic from the low below the heart and superior vena cava which brings the oxygenated blood from the top from the brain and the arms and then they all come sit in the waiting room in the right atrium and then and then a slight contraction begins whatever happens in the right also happens in the left slight contraction begins regulated by who where specifically you're no longer just allowed to point in a random place. Where specifically? Medulla oblongata. So that guy, through whom? Our friend, the vagus nerve. It kind of initiates roughly, this I mean this is not super precise, but this is roughly the case, initiates a slight contraction. By then, the deoxygenated blood has already come down to the ventricle, but about 30% is remaining. So that 30% is squeezed out, and then the valves snap shut between the waiting room and the ventricle. That's what you hear when you hear that heart sound is the sound of the valve snapping shut. And then a bigger contraction happens which squirts the blood left and right into the pulmonary and into the systemic circulation. Okay? And then once all of that happens, the blood returns, which we'll talk about quite a bit, back to the heart through a very intricate mechanism and comes back into the waiting room where the valves are open and then once it comes into the waiting room, and just before that little contraction starts, those valves snap shut. That's the smaller sound that you hear. So the time between the smaller and the bigger sound is when the real contraction happens. That's called the systole. And um, that pressure in the arteries, when you measure, is the top number of your blood pressure. That's a measure of how hard 
your heart is working. So if that upper number is, say, 160, then it means the heart's working a lot. Uh, okay. And then the, the thing where things are filling up that time is the diastole. That is a measure of how wide your arteries are. Okay, so the, uh, and that's why they say in the longer term, the, the, the systolic pressure kind of goes all over the place, but it's the lower number sometimes that's more indicative of some heart issues. Uh, of course, the upper number is indicative too if it goes to a high number. Uh, so that's, that's roughly a little bit of demystification if one was needed about these numbers. Got it? So um, what else do I have to say? Okay. Um, I want to give you a context. We have around slightly less than two gallons of blood. Bigger people have a little more blood and smaller people have a little less blood um, at any time, of which only 5% is in the heart at, at any given time. That's what's being pumped. 5% is in the capillaries where the actual respiration is happening. Okay? The rest of it is kind of sitting in the warehouses or in the highway, if you take the truck analogy. Uh, so about 10% is in the lungs. At any given point in time, 10% of you, your blood is in the lungs. 15% is on the way, reaching the capillaries, you know, stuck in a traffic jam, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's coming there. The remaining 65% is just hanging around in your veins, the, the deoxygenated blood. So the way to think about it is your arteries are more like rivers. You know, they, they flow really fast. And the veins are more like lakes. Not exactly, but it's kind of, you know, they are big and then they need some external stimulus to begin to flow. So that's, so what you see here, if you look at your hands, you see those things, those are veins, mostly. In general, they are veins. And that's, that's kind of where they fit in in the overall ecosystem. Okay? Uh, okay. Now let's come to yoga. Obviously, maintaining good circulation is, is very critical. So how does yoga help with this? So the number one thing is, say this muscle is tense. Everybody touch this muscle. This is the upper trapezius. This usually gets tense and you know, somebody comes and massages you and you say, oh, that feels good, or ouch, that really hurts, or probably both, usually. Um, that's uh, that muscle. If that muscle is tense, then, okay, uh, uh, let me, see. yeah, let me, I might as well say this. See, what happens is arteries are like fast flowing rivers, right? So if you nick an artery, you bleed a lot. But how often do you usually nick an artery? Almost never. Why is that? They are deep inside the body. That's how we are designed. See, if I have the, the, the femoral artery, which supplies my leg, runs on the inside, so I'm much less likely to nick it. Not only does it run on the inside, it's called medial, but at the same time, it is deep inside. It is surrounded by muscle. These arteries, in general, are surrounded by muscles. What happens when this muscle is tense? It's going to press an artery, does it not? So when it's going to press an artery, then these guys, which need that blood, trying to make a living, you know, doing their thing, get less and less blood, all because you got tense for some unknown reason. <gasps> and then this guy got affected with the blood flow. Now, that's okay, you know, this circle of joy that we just did, literally, part this, this last part where I had you stand there, one of its jobs is to stretch the upper trapezius, and it also stretches a muscle here. Um, what that does is, say you have, say you do a lot of typing, okay? Then this little carpal tunnel, this little narrow tunnel through which a bunch of ligaments and stuff pass. These muscles are not getting enough blood supply. So they are not working too well. And therefore they put more uh, load on these tendons, which are not supposed to have the load. And over time those tendons get inflamed, literally bigger. They literally get bigger. And then you will begin to have this wrist pain, carpal tunnel syndrome. Then, can, then somebody says, no, 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 do yoga, that helps. And then you say, that makes no sense. Because all my teacher made me do is something like this. He made me smile and all kinds of vague stuff. How is it possibly going to help the carpal tunnel syndrome? Because it increases circulation. Okay. 
uh, the inflammation, for it to go down, it needs blood. It's, you know, if there is a part of your house, you have some rotting wood there, then you need a truck to come and deliver new wood. Otherwise, there is nothing you can do. This is similar. So for this to go down, it needs circulation. So that is, as you relax these muscles, your circulation begins to increase. So that's number one. The second one is called squeeze and soak. So let's practice that one. Everybody come to the edge of um, edge of your chair. Let's see, how do we do this? It's a little bit odd to pre Let me sit this way so that you can see me. Sit so that most of you sit to the side. Everybody sit to the left side. Okay? Sit so that most of your thighs are off the chair. Only, mostly your bum is on the chair. Don't, don't keel over and fall down. So have a sense of your balance. And then, inhaling, press your buttocks into the chair. Really press. And then slightly arch your back. You'll find that your heart is automatically lifting. Now, now here comes the tricky part. Keep your belly relaxed. Make the eyes soft. You know, we're not out on a war with our body. So just say, send good thoughts to your body. Take a deep inhaling breath. And as you exhale, your left arm comes around to hold the back of the chair. Okay? And then the right arm also comes around. So you're sitting in a twisted position. Okay, now slowly inhaling, bring your belly button to the left. Bring your belly button to the left. Very deeply, release the shoulder blades down. Energize your abdomen, bring your belly button more to the left. Breathe in and out deeply. Twist a little bit more. Let your right shoulder come forward and your left shoulder go back so that you're opening through the chest. If you can, look over the left shoulder. Breathe in and out, three or four more times. Now fee see if you can feel the squeezing of your abdominal organs. Try and see if you can squeeze it by twisting more. And your kidneys are underneath your shoulder blades. See if you can squeeze those two. One more breath. Very good, everybody doing great. Inhaling, slowly untwist yourself so that you eventually end up facing sideways. And then pause for a couple of breaths. You've now squeezed it, you need to let it soak. I'll tell you what they mean in a moment. And then slowly turn to the other side. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side. Once again, the same thing. Begin to twist, this time with your left, uh, left arm comes on the uh, back of the chair that's closest to you. The right arm goes to the far side. Keep your knees facing forward. Don't let them turn one way or another. Keep the knees facing really forward. Slight arch in your low back, very slight arch in your low back, and begin to turn and twist. See if you can bring the belly button on top of the right thigh. That way you can begin to squeeze more and more. Lift your chest up, relax the shoulders down, look over the right shoulder. Feeling that squeeze. Breathe in and out. And slowly breathe in. As you exhale, turn to face to the side. Pause here for a couple of breaths. And then slowly turn to face forward. So this is a modification of a very wonderful uh, yoga pose called half spinal twist, Ardha Matsyendrasana. In Sanskrit, and what this pose does is, when when we when I twist this way, see if I let my hip twist, then I'm not doing much. But if my hips are right here, and I begin to twist like this, the more I twist, this left side of my abdomen is squeezed. It's literally squeezed. Did you all feel that little bit of a squeezing sensation? And then the right side. So as a result, all of your abdominal organs are literally 
squeezed. There is no mechanism that protects it from being squeezed, and that's a good thing. Um, so take the example of pancreas. The pancreas doesn't have good blood supply. Then it has trouble doing its job, which among other things is to maintain the insulin levels in the body. Okay? Um, and then when you do this pose, and then you, you squeeze the pancreas, then you can go back here. If, if these are the pancreatic cells, and then imagine that these cells are right here in there, and then when you squeeze those, you're, bring, you're literally bringing it in closer contact with the blood, but also you are, um, they, there are things, they, there is detritus in the pancreas, there is garbage in the pancreatic cells, which needs to make it into the lymph eventually, which it doesn't. So when you begin to squeeze it, you, you're literally squeezing the gunk out of it. it. It's not kind of metaphorical, you're literally doing it. And then when you release it, now a more cleansed pancreas is able to soak all the nutrients that it needs, all the uh, blood, all the oxygen that it needs, and so forth. Okay? Similarly, when you bend forward like this, you squeeze the abdomen. When you bend backwards, that's what you're referring to. When you bend backwards like this, you're squeezing the kidneys, and you're beginning to improve their function by improving circulation. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? So when, you, uh, when we stand up and then do, oh, you know, something like this, we are doing that squeezing, we are doing that soaking. Um, you know, you've been driving for a long time and then you do those little, little movements. Uh, this one that we just did is squeezing this thigh, using this to squeeze both the thigh and the abdominal organs and so forth. So there is a yoga teacher in India, uh, very well known, Iyengar, whom I often talk about in these classes. He, in his yoga classes, um, he, he, he treated diabetics, for example. And for diabetics, he literally gave the pose that I just showed you. Uh, there's things you do with your legs to increase the squeeze, but it's basically this pose. And then over time, their dependence on insulin supplements decreased by, uh, by quite a bit. In some cases, it was halved. And there, there are people, you'll find a yoga journal article on a lady who was with him at this time, and then she's documented the things that have gone on. It's in your references. Uh, and he used to do the same thing, this kind of squeeze for taking care of thyroid issues. Uh, and again, there was quite a bit of reduction in the supplements uh, that they had to take. So that's the second way, okay, improving circulation. And the third way is, uh, this is kind of an important thing. See, uh, if, the, if the blood has to go to the heart, uh, if the blood has to come to your little toe, then your heart pumps it, right? Somebody pushes it there. How does it come back? Who, who pushes it back to the heart? If it's in the brain, of course, it drains down. Who pushes the blood back? Any thoughts on that? Hmm? Uh, skeletal muscle, extremely precise answer. Uh, that's, that's exactly true. What, what happens is there is, I mean, there is still some residual pressure from the heart that will actually push it back. But for the most part, imagine a vein coming up from here. Okay. It's like this, and then when you, everybody lift uh, one of your legs, doesn't matter which one it is, and then point the toe strongly, very strongly, and begin to energize the bottom part of the leg. Now really energize, make them strong, and release, change sides, and then release. So what you just did there, if, if you are uh, bottom part of your foot cramped and just kind of rotate it a little bit. That happens every now and then. What happens is, so you take the calf muscle. The calf muscle became smaller. It, it contracted. When it contracted, it squeezed the vein that was going alongside it. And so it's, it's like squeezing something in a tube. Uh, it, it moves up. Why doesn't it move down? you squeeze it, it can move either way, right? Because inside the veins are one-way valves. There are valves like this, so you can only kind of go like this. So it, it moved up right here. And just by doing this, just by doing this, you can begin to return the blood back. So this guy 
now has disposed of the carbon dioxide. So the pH levels here go down and the brain doesn't have to do odd things with the heart to increase the pH level and so forth. Uh, have you guys read uh, these things? Uh, when, you, when you take an airplane, do you guys read those in-flight magazines? Uh, you know, besides having horrible shopping stuff on it and some <laughs> negotiations. I don't know why in-flight magazines have negotiation seminars. Uh, the past 20 years, every one of them advertises this negotiation seminar. Uh, the, the, the same one. Okay, check it out next time. But the other thing they've begun doing, which is far more useful, is the kind of exercises you need to do when you're sitting on an airplane. Anybody come across that? And this especially happens on the longer flight. All of them, uh, and they talk about something called DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and that's, we don't need to go into details of what it is, but in the end, uh, increasing circulation will help you not have that bad condition which will eventually lead to a stroke. Uh, this, this, they suggest literally doing this exercise, this exercise and a few others uh, which will help venous circulation. So when you do yoga postures and when you lift your legs up, you are allowing the deoxygenated blood return back to the heart. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Any questions on this before we switch gears? But no, actually that, that is true. It, it could. It, it won't always, thank God. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, any, any other questions or comments? Uh, there are those things, just by walking and exercising, you're forcing that valve to... You are, but absolutely. But also part of the management of varicose veins is, um, for example, legs up the wall. If you go lie down next to a wall and put your legs up, that's, that's very, very healing for it. Um, Any time, uh, it's ac part of it is actually simple. Uh, these guys have an advantage that gravity drains it, whereas these guys don't have that advantage. So if you can change that, and if you invert yourself, why do yogis insist on standing on their heads? Partly they're weird, which, is, which goes without saying, but partly it's very, very good for you. And the, uh, the main, one of the main reasons is this, you will drain the venous blood back into the heart. But that's not all. Uh, there, is, there is more. So let me shift gears a little bit and talk about the lymphatic system. So it's, uh, what's, what's really interesting, what I show up there is, see, your, your blood through the capillaries is at a very high pressure. It's, it's high enough that blood plasma can actually begin to leak. Okay, it literally leaks, uh, and one third of your blood leaks this way. Uh, and it, it comes into the space in between the cells, and it's just hanging out there. And if you do nothing to reclaim it, then within two days you will no longer have blood and you'll die. Literally, you know, its heart will be running on fumes and then eventually, dude, I got nothing to pump. You know? And it, it'll all be filled in this inter, uh, interstitial space, is what it's called. So what we have are these little tubes. And they just hang around there. You know, there is probably some lymphatic uh, vessels right here, deep inside my hand. It, it's just hanging around there. Its job is to reclaim this plasma. It takes this plasma and then brings it back up. And eventually, it comes from here, 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 everywhere. And then if you find your collarbone, find your, find your sternum, which is your breastbone right here, follow it up to the collarbone, move to the side just a little bit, you know, where you see that prominent projection. Right around there is when all of this reclaimed blood comes back into the vein. Okay, it's called the subclavian uh, vein. For what it's worth, it's up there. It's in your handout. You can take a look later. But that's where it all comes back and then goes right into the heart. Okay? Again, there is no pump for this one either. So how does it get back there? It needs to 
get squeezed. So if there is no squeezing, then this blood doesn't come back there at all. Now, how it actually squeezes, uh, they, actually there is two ways that it will come back. One way is by squeezing. So if you, if you begin from here, and then you squeeze this literally, okay, you, you can actually do this. We won't do it too much, but if you, if you begin to squeeze, do this action, it, it kind of feels good, right? If you don't overdo it, you kind of squeeze and let it go, it kind of feels good. What you are doing, among other things, is forcing the lymph back up. It, it's coming up the lymphatic system like this, and then you can keep doing it all the way, and it's kind of odd to do it here. Somebody else should do it for you, but nonetheless, and it's harder to squeeze because there is bones there, but as you begin to do it, it comes all the way here and then drains into this one. There is another thing that happens too. When we breathe in, like, when we breathe in like that, the, you know, the diaphragm is attached to the heart. Uh, it's literally actually physically attached to the heart. So when the diaphragm moves down, it, it pulls the heart with it. So every time you breathe, actually, your heart gets massaged, which, you, you know, if anybody in the body deserves a massage, it's your heart, uh, right? We often get our shoulders massaged and stuff. They don't really deserve it. Compared to the heart, they're not doing anything. Uh, but and every time you breathe, the heart gets a massage. But the other thing that happens is when you breathe, the vacuum is created, which is how, of course, air comes into the body. But at the same time, this lymph drains into the heart, literally. So when you do that deep breath, lymph is draining into the heart. And if you do a sharp deep breath, and you're really draining the lymph back into the heart just by doing that, okay? So remember I told you this 20-part body recharging is kind of the exercise that you can do Let's all stand up and with this lymphatic thing in mind, just tune into what you're doing with this exercise. First, what you have to do is, in a wave, from here to here, all the way, you need to tense. So you don't tense your whole body, you tense it in a wave, literally, to move the lymph and the venous blood up. Let's try it. <laughs> Try that again with this intuition. <laughs> you're, you're squeezing it. Now let's try it one by one. You can close your eyes. Tune into all this activity inside. Left foot, right, and right, uh, left calf, right. You're moving the lymph up. Left thigh, right. Tense deeply and release. Left buttock, deep tensing, right, abdomen, stomach. Left forearm, right, left upper arm, right, left side of chest, right, relax, left side of throat, relax, right side of throat, relax, front of the throat, back of the neck, then relax. Pause for a moment, see if you can feel the circulation, it's not that hard to feel. That's why they say relax and feel, you need to tune in, you need to intuit the purpose. And if you notice it, then it feels happier. Now, let's try this. Try this with three or four deep breaths. As we continue to tense and hold, let's tense the left foot, hold, right foot, left calf, right, continue to breathe, left thigh, right, left buttock, right, abdomen, stomach, left forearm, right, upper arm, right, chest, right, throat, right, center, back. Then breathe deeply. Imagine this venous blood and lymph draining into the heart. Continue breathing in and out, more and more tensing. You're pushing this up. Then, double breath in. Then as you relax, just a chin to chest. And then, opposite way, right chest, left, right upper arm, left, right forearm, left. Stomach, abdomen, right buttock, left, right thigh, left, right calf, left, right foot, left. Double breath in, once again. And breathe out. Pause for a moment. Notice your body. Notice the changes. And slowly have a seat, please. So did you get a sense of why this exercise is designed this way and what it does? Okay, it, it, do you see how it follows these exact paths like this? 
That is kind of the purpose. Um, but there is more to this. Um, I just talked about this, so I, I don't need to um, dwell on this uh, too much. I'll come back to this. But part of your lymphatic system has to do with your immunity. Okay? So let me talk about immunity and then I'll put all of these together. Now let's say you get, there's a nail and it's dipped in cow manure. So it's got all kinds of crappy stuff on it. And then you get poked with it. Okay? Then let's figure out what happens in the body. So when, when that gets poked in there, the, 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 the skin cells um, release a molecule into the body. These are, these are alarm bells. These are called chemokines. Chemochemical kinds. I don't know what kinds means. It's alarm maybe. Uh, it, it releases that. And then at the same time, it releases something called histamine. All of you have heard of histamine, right? How many of us have ingested something to do with histamine? Uh, right? uh, so what the histamine does is it literally makes your blood vessels bigger. Uh, these little capillaries which are right here, it literally makes it bigger. It becomes so big that some of the blood escapes into the skin cell. But the escaping blood is a specific kind. Okay, they are called uh, phagocytes. Phagocytes. Well, what they do is they are, they are your security guards. They got attracted by the alarm bell. So they just gather around here. And then these things begin to open up. So what do you notice in that place where you, you got poked with the nail? Begins to swell up, right? What do you call that? Inflammation. This is literally the inflammation response. That's why it's histamine. When you block the histamine, you no longer get inflamed. So this inflammation response brings these white blood cells called phagocytes to this particular location. What do, what do these phagocytes do? They do something very interesting. They have a way of finding out what the bad organisms are, what the bad bacteria is. Do you know how? This, uh, this, uh, I found this quite stunning when I first found out. Every cell in your body carries with it a little identifier saying, hey, I belong to you. Every single cell actually carries it. Okay? Um, uh, these are called antigens. Uh, so they, they, it, it kind of carries the antigen with you, which your phagocytes know, oh, this, this is one of mine. I don't need to touch them. You know, they, it's like, show me a license and insurance, please, and if you show it, you don't get a ticket. So every cell in your body carries this. So these guys go looking around. Oh, there is histamine. There is all kinds of stuff. What's going on? They say, oh, I smell cow manure. What's going on? And then they find these bacteria in there. And you know what they do? Is they literally go eat it up. They literally eat it. And, you know, it's been observed in a microscope. They eat it. But here is the beauty of what they do. Once they eat it, they kind of hold up a sign saying, this is what I ate. Okay? Uh, and that's, again, that's also called an antigen. These are all proteins that I'm talking about. And they hold up a sign saying, this is what I ate. And this is hanging around there in the bloodstream, in the, in the space between the cells. That gets swept back into your lymph node, in, into your lymph, lymphatic system. Say you got poked here. It gets swept back, and then there is a lymph node somewhere along the way. There are 600 lymph nodes in your body. Then in there, this bacteria goes in there, and then this phagocyte go in there, and the phagocyte says, hey, this is what I just killed. You might want to take a look. Lymph node is like a police station. Okay, that's where, you know, the bacteria has been swept in there. And so it says, huh, okay, what do we got here? Who are the malefactors? Who are, nobody says malefactors anymore. Uh, the, who are the... Who are the bad guys? I had to take an exam before coming to the United States because they had to make sure that I knew enough English. So we learned words like malefactors and rapacious and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, so yes, who are the bad guys in here? And then this phagocyte says, you know, if anybody you see with this kind of antigen is a bad guy, I have confirmed it. And then we have two very incredible cells within these lymph nodes, they are called 
B cells and T cells. Must have all heard of this, right? Those guys can generate the exact kind of toxin that is necessary to kill this bacteria by the sign that it sees. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It's actually 10 times more complex, but it's roughly accurate what I'm saying. It begins to generate those and release them in the bloodstream. Each B cell can generate 2,000 of these toxins every minute, just keeps generating. The body goes into overdrive. Okay, and there are uh, you know millions and millions of these, and then it just keeps generating, and then they go attack the bacteria, and it's it's amazing how they kill it. It's actually you know it feels like reading a Tom Clancy thing or something. People are getting killed and neutralized with extreme prejudice all over the place, <laughs> uh, and that's what happens in the lymph nodes, and the bacteria gets killed, and for the most part. You see, the, the efficacy of this system is so extraordinary that, you know, smallpox, right? You know, of smallpox. Um, I, I grew up in India at a time where I actually saw smallpox. I had friends who had small, smallpox infections because it was not yet eradicated. It, it's a horrible disease. And, you know, I used to think later. At the time in India, you paid no attention because that's, it's part of what you grow up with. But later I thought everybody that gets smallpox dies. But it really isn't the case. Um, only 30%. Smallpox has 30% mortality rate, which means even with an organism as virulent as smallpox, our immune system, in two out of three cases, can kill that and get over it. Bubonic plague, which is one of the most infectious common diseases, uh, is still 60% mortality rate. Uh, and these are big. That's why these common colds come and go, and your immune system just goes into action. Uh, it's, it's really quite extraordinary how it works. Now let's come back. What is the key to making this immune system work? Circulation. You need these bad guys to come to the police station. Do you not? If you don't, then nothing happens. If you have poor circulation, then a pinprick will lead to infection. You see, the thing is, very rarely does your blood get infected. Very rarely. And whenever the blood actually gets infected, it's very, very serious. Uh, you know, uh, it's called sepsis. And that's, that's a fairly serious condition. Most infections don't get into the blood. They get into the lymph. That's the beauty of this lymphatic system, is it lies here. It, it doesn't disturb. It doesn't, it's, it's like, um, any analogy I take makes me want to use the word toilet. I'm trying to think how I shouldn't, since I'm being recorded. Um, but I have no other way to say it. Uh, see, you, you kind of keep your toilet stuff and your food stuff separate, right? Uh, that is similar. The, the, the lymphatic system, which takes all of the crap, is completely separate from the blood, which takes all of the food. And they, they're really kept quite separate. But without circulation, without you every now and then doing this one, or doing this in the airplane, or doing this, this one doesn't work. Okay? So this is one of the key ways in which, say, energiz energization especially, but equally, well, yoga helps with keeping your immune system uh, healthy. So when you have, uh, people frequently ask me this question that they, uh, you know, they say, they have a, lib I, I have this usually when I teach the Saturday morning class, right before class somebody comes and tells me, I'm not feeling too good, should I do yoga? What might be the answer to that question? Usually yes, but, do it in such a way that you don't get too tired. Because different things happen when you get too tired. I'll come to that in a minute. Because you, and literally, if, if you have, I had this, um, um, I had this experience about, it's, it's been maybe about 10 years ago, where um, I fell down the stairs and broke my tailbone. Anybody bro broken their tailbone? It's a very embarrassing, but nonetheless, uncomfortable condition. You can't really say what's going on. You have to sit on a donut and all kinds of stuff. Uh, right? Uh, and 
but there was uh, my yoga teacher at the time, uh, he made me do some really good uh, exercise which, which lasted for about three hours. Uh, and then he assured me that this will help with healing the tailbone. Uh, and I went, when I went back to the chiropractor, uh, he was really amazed at how quickly it had healed because he had told me that this is something I have to, uh, at, at my age, uh, it's something that I had, it would take about eight to 12 weeks to heal. And in my case, it healed in about three weeks, uh, completely, you know, end to end. And he was amazed. And I would like to attribute it to the fact that I did those exercises on that day, immediately, this was on a Saturday night when I fell on the stairs, fell down the stairs, and Sunday morning when we did this, and the fact that I did it continuously for the next two or three weeks. And now I understand why, which is, that's what prompted me to look into this way back 10 years ago, in a sense, that's why this class has been brewing for about 10 years for me, not just this one, but many other such things. Um, so, where I'm going with it is, Exercise really helps you heal. And I just told you one way of how it helps with the immune system. See, any medicine that we take, uh, in, in terms of this particular thing, in terms of immune system, uh, is generally far less powerful than our own immune system. You know, antibiotics are very, very powerful. They are life-saving. They are extraordinary drugs. But they, if the immune system failed, then it is very hard to have to give molecules externally to substitute for it. And we, we of course, see this in, you know, in advanced cases of AIDS, for example. There is really very little that you can do in terms of pharmacological intervention because the immune system does so much. It's extraordinary. And a very simple way to keep it working is tense and relax. Breathe deeply, invert yourself every now and then, and we'll, we'll all do a little bit of an inversion in about five minutes, just to give you a sense. Uh, it has other benefits, so I'm waiting to say something else so that you can experience both of them. Invert yourself. When you do yoga, you spread your legs wide apart and then bend forward. You turn one way and then the other. You, I mean, you're doing squeeze and soak, you're doing all the other stuff, and just to, even more importantly, you're working with your immune system. Does that make sense? Everybody? Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, for people who are very ill, um, how much of it is the help to have like a therapist do exercises for them? Wonderful question. The question is, when people are very ill, how much does it help? Uh, how, how useful is it to have a therapist do exercises for them. Very, extremely useful. Uh, you know, when, when you're very ill and you cannot, uh, not so much motivate, but you cannot move by yourself or you cannot move in the right way, somebody else producing the same muscular contractions in you is extremely useful. Uh, so, yeah, and that's why things like massage, for example, for the same reason. In fact, massage therapists uh, is, is anybody here practice massage? Okay, you guys are taught how to drain the lymphatic system, right? And uh, you know, you guys, it's, it's, uh, you, you begin by working here, literally where it's called the venous angle. That's, that's kind of where you begin to work. Um, and massage therapy is very, very useful. Physiotherapy where somebody comes and helps you do those exercises, very useful. Somehow the body needs to move. See, the, um, what happens to a car if you put it in the garage for three months? Next time when you go and start it, you know, if it's an old car, it's a clunker, it won't start, uh, right? If it's a new car, I had a Toyota Prius and I went to India once for four weeks, it wouldn't start after I came back. Uh, that's, human body is that way too. It needs to move. The amount of motion is relative. My little Toyota Prius doesn't have to move like a Ferrari does. It has to do what's appropriate for it, okay? Uh, and by talking about circulation in the immune system, I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. Let me now switch gears. We'll stay on the topic of immune system and we'll see the other ways in which this can be helpful. Uh, I talked about increased lymphatic circulation. Now we are going 
into somewhat of deeper topics, which we can do because Hriman is here. We've been waiting for him. <laughs> oh, sorry, couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> so, you know how when we go to work, we, we kind of have, uh, when it's time to go to work, it kind of, okay, you, you get dressed up and then uh, you are in a hurry and when you are at work, you perhaps don't think about eating, you don't sit back and just relax and veg out for a couple of hours, you don't do that. We are, uh, whereas when you come back home or in the weekends, you kind of relax and let things go and begin to heal yourself a little bit, sleep in on Sundays, do your laundry, clean up your surroundings and stuff. So there is a work mode and there is a weekend mode. We are similar too. Our nervous system has a work mode and then it has a weekend mode. They are called sympathetic work mode, parasympathetic weekend mode. Now here is the key thing. They are not separate. It's not like you are, you know, you are being chased by a bear so you are in sympathetic mode and then you are all relaxed and you are in parasympathetic mode. That is also true but in general, minute by minute, there is this sympathetic part of the body that is doing things and parasympathetic part which is doing things. Here is what happens when the work mode, when the body gets into work mode, the heart rate increases. You know this ventricle that I talked about which actually pumps, it pumps more. So instead of pumping like this, it pumps this way, more, more deeply so that there is more uh, ejection volume of the blood. Then other very interesting thing happens your blood vessels become smaller or larger as is necessary. Uh, if, uh, if it needs to flow quicker, then it kind of becomes smaller, increasing the pressure through it, okay? And then uh, another thing happens. You have a hormone called cortisol. How many of you have heard of cortisol? What does it do? other than what I said there. What does it do? Just, you know, everybody talks about cortisol, right? Yeah, it's, it's called as the stress hormone. It, it, we, we produce it in reaction to stress. It has a very wonderful function. You know, the main function of cortisol is to ensure... Uh, actually, let me ask this. Everybody knows about cortisol. Why does cortisol exist? Why did the creator in his or her infinite wisdom, create cortisol? Yes, but why specifically? It's fight or flight. And what it needs to do, the, the purpose of cortisol, very, very important, is to ensure that the brain never runs out of glucose. That's its primary purpose. That's why it was, it was created. So we shouldn't knock it. it. It's there for a very wonderful reason. But here is the problem. When we have chronic stress or when we, when we work ourselves into a corner, when, you know, whatever the reason, we have the sense of gentle doom hanging over us all the time. It, you know, it doesn't come and kill us, nor does it go back and leave us. It's that kind of stuff. Those things keep your work mode constantly active. You never get the chance to sit down, veg out, clean your house, do the laundry. None of that happens, okay? Scientifically, this is called the uh, sympathetic tone. Tone is the amount by which anything is active. Muscle tone is the amount by which muscle is active. It's like idle speed. Sympathetic tone, you say the sympathetic tone has increased and that has all kinds of issues with it. But it does have one good thing. When the sympathetic tone is increased just a little bit, then you remember those phagocytes that I said, these killer robocop kind of guards that go and eat up all of these bacteria that come into uh, your tissues? There is more of them in the bloodstream, somehow. And you know when the sympathetic tone gets increased just the right amount, if it goes too much then bad things happen, but when, when it gets increased by just the right amount, you know when it happens? When you do moderate exercise. Not overtrain yourself, not undertrain yourself, but when you do moderate exercise, such as energization, for example, such as 
a gentle yoga routine. If you run for three miles at the time, if you overdo it, then actually studies have shown that people run for that run for three miles day every day, uh, and if you overtrain that way, your immune system is actually compromised. But when you do moderate exercise, then there is enough, stress is not a bad thing, it's certainly not a four-letter word, neither literally nor figuratively. It's not a bad thing because it allows your immune system to flood your blood with these, you know, phagocytes. So if you have, once again, we come back to that question, you have slight sickness or you have a wound, that, you know, you have kind of a systemic wound that you want some extra help to heal, do you do energization or not? In general, the answer is yes. And that's why we are told, you know, if you have slight cold or sniffles, then it's okay to do energization and meditation. If, if you're, you know, fully down, then the inflammation is to a point where all systems are working to kill the bacteria. Then, of course, you shouldn't distract it. But otherwise, not only can you do it, you should do it. Because sympathetic activation increases the number of phagocytes. Okay, now, many studies, study after study, has found the following interesting thing about yoga practice. And I do include energization in this. It has found that when you do yoga, I mean, you find your sympathetic system is activated, your, uh, uh, you know, your heart rate goes up, and all the stuff that happens with exercise happens. But unlike exercise, what happens is after yoga, they found that you're more relaxed than you would after exercise. Even if you go in the zone, you do the, you do the endorphin thing and all of that stuff, you're more relaxed than any of that after yoga. Meaning somehow yoga makes you switch into the weekend mode. Meaning it reduces the sympathetic tone, activates the parasympathetic response in your body. So now let's come to cortisol or good friend. So if you have this chronic stress, whatever that might be, there is chronic stress due to job, chronic stress due to, you know, economic meltdown, relationship, whatever it might be. If you have stress over a long period of time, which never lets go, there is that teeny tiny feeling in the stomach, that sense of doom hanging around, then that increases the level of cortisol in the body. So what happens is when you have high level of cortisol, you remember those B cells and T cells that I talked about within your lymph nodes? There is actually less of them. The, this cortisol prevents, uh, there is a good reason for it, but we don't need to go into it. it. It prevents the number of T cells in your immune system, and it does all kinds of other things as well. When you do yoga and you begin to relax, this cortisol begins to decrease in your bloodstream. And therefore, it jumpstarts your immune system again. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? So, here are three good reasons why energization and yoga is good for your immune system. Once again, it, there is a mild excitation. That's why, say, for example, energization says, tense with will. That's why when we teach yoga, you'll see yoga teachers saying, this is the time you need to have your body involved. You can't do yoga in la-la land. You cannot do sleepy time yoga. Your body has to be involved. Same with energization. If you're tensing your bicep, you should tense your bicep. You, you, it's, there's really no two ways about it. You should, low, medium, high, it should vibrate. Why? Because it increases the number of phagocytes. What an interesting thing, you know, what a strange way of answering the question. Or you can say it makes you heal faster, but that's why it does. So if somebody asks you, if I did this bicep recharging, if I stood on my head, if I did a deep back bend, how could I possibly heal faster? This is why, okay? And the same time, your lymph can begin to clean things and take things back to the police station so that they can get their comeuppance. That was another word we had to learn. <laughs> I had to come to the US. I realized nobody uses these words here. Um, but they, they did test us for this. So they do get their comeuppance in the lymph nodes, but you need that circulation. Uh, they're just retribution, I believe, is what that means, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, reduces cortisol. 
Now there is, yes. I have a distance runner, and he claims that the the running increases the body temperature, like a fever increases the body temperature, and that kills the germs in the body, and that's why he thinks him and his friends don't get sick very often. The first part is true. Running does literally increase the body temperature. Not only that, uh, what running does is um, it, 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 it makes your blood vessels in, in the skin become bigger, okay? Which is how the heat is dissipated. Um, so in one sense, it's, it's very close to the inflammation response. So that much is physiologically true. I, I don't know whether that actually kills the germs and does all the other things. It might, it might not. I, I haven't come across any studies that do that. But it does dilate your blood vessels in the, near the skin, just like your inflammation response would do. So, OK. Anything else? OK, there is. I didn't get to talk about this last time. I didn't get to talk about it this time. This, this is sufficiently interesting and sufficiently deep that I don't want to shortchange this. Uh, and since we have about three minutes left, let me, again, uh, look back over the entire class and ask, are there any thoughts, any comments, any experiences, opinions, random thoughts that you have? Anything at all? Okay, Masha. <laughs> uh, you haven't mentioned this. And it, uh, have you studied at all the relationship between yoga and sleep and the effectiveness of sleep? I've, I've read that our body does its healing while we're sleeping. Yes. Um, uh, yes, there, there's, uh, there's certainly a lot that I have to say on that topic. It kind of begins off from here, which, um, yes, yoga does uh, take you into deeper states of sleep. And when you are sleeping, it does uh, activate your parasympathetic nervous system, for sure. Uh, so the, the short answer is yes, it is, it is good for sleep. And uh, of course, as many meditators experience, it does reduce your need for sleep as well. So there is, there is both sides of the equation. And the, the, the right way to look at it is because of the way yoga works with your nervous system, it makes your sleep more efficient, so to speak. Uh, to the extent, I mean, there are many reasons why we sleep. Uh, but from a physical perspective, it, the sleeping is a way of the body forcing you to stop and heal. You, you know, that's a, you really have no choice but to do that. And it speeds up the healing process during sleep. Uh, and there is, there is a bunch of things about which we won't necessarily go into even next week. But there are things about what you should and shouldn't do before sleep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in, in general, see, you see this first thing, sympathetic activation. Um, as a general rule, when you bend backwards, anything that, uh, any posture that you do this kind of a movement causes this. Okay, so if you did that just before sleep, it's, it's roughly like drinking a little cup of coffee. Uh, you know, in terms of what it does. Uh, but anything that makes you come forward helps you do the opposite, the parasympathetic activation. Anytime you do this, that's parasympathetic activation. Okay? So there are, there are a few rules like that. I, I can, uh, since there is some interest, I will go over it. Do remind me if I forget next week. Any, any other thoughts? OK, let me finish with this 
parting thought. Uh, as Yogananda said, the whole purpose of true exercise is to awaken the inner energies that we have ignored all our lives. That is the purpose. What is the technique? How all of these things that you have learned, how does that tell you how yoga should be done? Or see, yoga is not just either energization or standing on your head. It is that too, but in the end, as Swami says, anything we do can be yoga. What is that secret sauce that these scientific things tell us? So there is, uh, I was intrigued by Masha's question about the Gita verse that you had asked last week, whether science tells us anything. So I went back to the Gita. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 48, uh, Gita is one of the source books of yoga, for those of you that don't know it, and it's a conversation between a disciple and his teacher, is one way of looking at it. And then the disciple asks uh, the teacher some questions, and in the end, the teacher ends up saying what yoga is. And the definition is very simple. Even-mindedness is yoga. Okay, it says, don't go too far this way or too far that way. Even-mindedness, the equivalent of even-mindedness in our bodies is something we talked about last week. Homeostasis, meaning maintaining the body systems in the center, not too much body temperature or too little, not too much blood pressure or too little, not breathing too deeply, not doing anything too much. That is when yoga is maximally beneficial. So if you're doing energization, if you tense, you relax, come back to even mindedness so that the net is the same. When you do yoga, it's very, very important not to overdo it. I, I cannot stress the importance of it. If you do overdo it, then all the things that we talked about, be it circulation, um, be it uh, easing of the breath rate, decrease in the blood pressure, which we didn't get to talk about, immune system, every one of them will begin to unravel. So even-mindedness is the definition of yoga, and science is telling us why that is so, should additional proof be required. Okay, so that is the parting thought for today. Next week, we will talk about blood pressure, but we'll also talk a little bit about joints and, you know, things like osteoporosis, uh, where yoga comes in for that one. Things like where, what does yoga do in terms of uh, back health and uh, slightly more physical topics, but we won't do anything more physical than what we did today, but we'll explore the science behind it. Okay, so... Thank you, everybody, for coming. Once again, I we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Here is the little library for today. Uh, please feel free to browse it, and here are the handouts. Uh, please pick one up on your way out. I still don't have the handouts for last week. Okay? It's not because of lack of trying. It's just whatever. I still don't have it, but I, do, I will hope to have it by next week. Okay? Thank you.